my name is May, and uh, I'm from uh, SAS Toronto. This morning when I left home, it was seven degrees. Uh, so I was clearly not ready for this. <laughs> anyway, I'm very excited to be here, to be doing this, because a big part of my job is to be uh, talking to clients, to be advising and coaching them on um, artificial intelligence solutions, right? And that ranges from talking to business leaders and executives on what AI is and isn't, because there are a lot of misconceptions out there. But it also um, includes talking to practitioners and modelers and data scientists on what to keep in mind when designing an AI solution, right? Because if you're working on a cool personal project or if you're doing a small scale kind of a solution, the success of that looks very different from the success of an AI solution in an enterprise landscape, right? Uh, like engineers would say, I don't know why it works, but it works. Right? So you can stitch something together and make it work, but that is not something that might fly in a larger production environment. So my goal here today is to share with you some of those learnings, some best practices, things to keep in mind um, as practitioners, um, how to design an AI solution, what to keep in mind, and how to make sure that it's a successful one. So before I start, how many of you would consider yourselves to be data scientists? or advanced practitioners, or modelers. OK, and how many are you, of you are aspiring data scientists, or citizen data scientists, or just here to learn a little bit more about these solutions? OK, great. And how many of you believe this to be the face of AI today? <laughs> Nobody, great. See, if I put up a picture of Pepper, more hands would go up, right? But that's great, because you know what this means? This means that I don't need to throw up a Wikipedia definition of artificial intelligence, right? That's what I have to do when I talk to business leaders. Um, instead, instead, I'm going to go right into an example. So imagine this horrifying scenario. Uh, you're driving in this ungodly weather. I know you don't have much snow out on the roads, but pretend you do, because we do in Toronto. So it, this made sense in my head. Um, the guy coming across from you is feeling very confident in his all-season tires. He swerves a little bit, and you get into a little fender bender, right? Um, very inconvenient. But you open up your insurance app, and a chat box pops up. And you start typing in there what has happened, just like you would to a friend, right? And as you're typing in and you're giving information to this chat bot, this chat bot uses natural language understanding to start a claims process for you. It starts analyzing your situation. It asks you qualifying questions like, uh, well, what is your license plate number? It uses a rule-based system to make sure that this is not a fraudulent case, that this is, in fact, um, it matches your records. Uh, it also asks you for a picture of the crash. Using image recognition, it starts assess assessing the depth of the damage. And then it goes an extra mile, and it offers to call you an Uber on the house if your car is in an undrivable condition. Right? And it starts your claims process in the background. So a good AI solution is one that's very simple to use for the consumer. Right? From the consumer side, this is you went in, you talked to the bot just like you would talk to a friend, and it um, got stuff done for you. But we know that in the background there are a lot of procedures and models running in the background. Right? We know that there's a lot of work that went behind the scenes. But to the consumer, he doesn't care. It doesn't matter. That's a simple AI solution, and that's what it should look like, right? Now let's just go into something that is more in our realm, right? So what are some of these things that run in the background? What are some of these models or processes that run in the background? What are the building blocks of AI? And this is what I call the AI spectrum. I don't know if everybody in the back can see, so I'll just call out some of these bubbles. So what's happening here? is we have all these bubbles on the outside. Uh, those are things like rule-based system, predictive analytics, deep learning, machine learning, robotics, computer vision. And at the heart of it all is automation, right? So AI is not a, it's not a tool. It's not, it's not um, one function, right? It is a, it's a customized solution. You pick and choose the bubbles that you need that are relevant to your problem. You stitch it together, automate it, optimize a process, and that's your AI solution. Right? And every AI solution is going to be different from each other. I put this slide up at one of the conferences I was at, and somebody said to me, in my perspective, if you're using 
two or more of these bubbles combined with automation, you're doing AI. Right? So that's, uh, those are just some of the things that you would stitch together. That's what goes on into building an AI solution. But the consumer of your, of your models or your work does not really care about the nitty gritty. They don't really care about what predictive model you used or whether you built a neural network. They don't care about that. They care about the information that's coming out of it, right? They care about the insights that you're generating for them. For example, a fraud analyst would just want to open their uh, dashboard and get a list of outlying cases or possible fraudulent cases. They just know that sophisticated math went into this process, there was an outlier detection process, and here are the cases that he now needs to investigate. Just like that, marketing's just really gonna care about a list of customers who are most likely to churn. They don't care whether they're coming from a gradient boost model or they're coming from a random forest. They just wanna know that they can trust it and it's as accurate and as updated as possible, right? Um, just like that, your customers might want recommendations and suggestions based on what other people like who have interests similar to them. They don't care how you do it, what association model you use. Right, so this is the kind of information that people feel entitled to, right? They don't care the kind of work that you do in the background to get there, they just care that they get accurate, easy, and up-to-date answers. So it falls on uh, the modelers, it falls on the data scientists to get that work done, right, to provide those answers and provide them with a level of trust and integrity. So I've been having a lot of conversations with organizations who are um, looking to increase their analytic maturity, right? AI is hyped up, everybody knows there's something called artificial intelligence, they all want it, whether or not they're ready for it, or whether or not they understand it. They just want AI. In fact, I've seen solutions where somebody just automated a dashboard and branded it as an AI solution. They were very proud of it, but it was just a scheduled report, you know? So there, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. There's a lot of hype out there. Um, so people always ask me, what, what makes for a successful AI solution? We don't want to invest in technology and then down the road realize that we, we didn't invest in the right technology because you have so many diff new companies, new platforms, new uh, promises. In, in the AI space, right? So how do you navigate around that and make sure that you're stitching together something that's gonna work, stand the test of time, something that actually delivers? So what I did was I put together what I call navigating stars, right? Uh, to help you, help you figure out whether or not you're kinda going in the right direction. And they're very simple. And I love that this is very similar to what Dan kinda showed you earlier, right? Uh, in my opinion, if you hit these three marks, you're probably going to deliver a successful AI solution. So the first thing is explain, manage, and skill. So let's unpack this a little bit. Explainability. What does it mean and why is it important? So we don't have any shortage of um, advanced, sophisticated, complex machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms. The algorithms are out there. There are lots of packages, libraries, you can grab anything and make it work. Right? We don't have shortage of that kind of sophisticated math. But we also know that as these algorithms and these models, they increase in their complexity or in their sophistication or in their prediction accuracy, they start losing explainability. All right? And someone brought this up earlier, that they become black boxes. right? And that is a big limitation. Because again, if you're just doing this as a science experiment or if it's a research project of your own, you don't really care because you're getting the answers that you want. But in an enterprise landscape, people want answers, right? Customers want to know that your model is treating them fairly. Regulators want to know why you made the decisions that you made. Business leaders want to know that they can trust the results of your model. And if you build a complicated neural network, no one's gonna deploy it it doesn't matter if it's really great because no one can trust it. It's a it becomes a liability. Your work is suddenly a liability, right? So what do we do about that? What's the, what's the workaround? Any guesses? Do we just compromise uh, complexity for explainability? Someone nodded. Someone said, yes, we do that. <laughs> Go back to linear regression models. No. 
uh, fortunately, there are techniques we can use, right? There are workarounds to these problems. So you could build a neural network or a deep learning model and still be able to bring a level of transparency to it, right? Uh, so we can do things like uh, use something simple, uh, like a decision tree model as a surrogate to something more complicated, like a neural network. You know, we know neural networks are very good at uh, showing variable importance plots. So what are the top drivers for an output? So if you just attach a decision tree right after your complicated model, it will be able to explain your complicated model a little bit better. Another thing you can do is you have things like partial dependence plots. So what these do is, uh, what these do uh, is they try to go into the relationship between your input and your target, and they try to uh, explain what the marginal effect of one input or all the inputs is on your target, right? And it's a partial dependence plot, so it's exactly what it sounds like. It shows the partial dependence between your input and your target. Ice plots take it just a little bit further. Partial dependence plots average everything out to give you an overall view. Ice plots go instance by instance and they go into a little bit more detail telling you what the additive effects are, what the interactions are, you know, why this target, why this input was chosen, and when you change it a little bit, how does your prediction change? Right? And that's, the kind, that's what I mean by transparency. If you can put that kind of stuff to justify your models, then that's it. That's where, that's where trust comes in. That's where integrity comes in. And we also have things like line plots, which are a little bit more involved. Um, people joke about line plots because they're a little bit um, harder to understand. So they say it's an explanation plot that requires an explanation. But basically, they just um, break down your complicated model into local simpler models. So the assumption line plots make is that every complex model is linear on a local level. So it just brings it down to a very small level, understands it, and tells you why a prediction was made. Right? And now you know. And now you're able to put this in front of your regulators and say, this is why we make the decision we make. So this becomes very important, because this is what brings trust to your work. And that's why explainability is very important in an artificial intelligence landscape, because you could use complicated models, but you also got to be able to explain them. And another thing to keep in mind is that um, explainability shouldn't be an afterthought. This is not something that you should scramble to do when you're questioned, right? And this is not something you should do uh, after all the modeling work has been done. This is something that should be baked into the process. This, should, this is not an afterthought, right? Within your modeling studio, within your modeling environment, wherever you're coding, wherever you're working, that's exactly where your uh, model interpretability plots should be living as well. It should be part of the analytics process. Manageability. So management is a, is a broad term, and uh, it, it means a couple of different things. So the first thing it means is governance of your work, governance of your models. You've done all this modeling work. You've built all these models. And I'm going to assume you're not the only one building these models. There are other people on the team that are also contributing and building models. Right? And you're not just going to build one model once. You're going to build maybe champion challenger models. You're going to build experimental models, maybe different models for a different use case. Right? All these models need to live in a common repository. They need a library where they can be registered, where you have visibility into what was done last year, the year before, what is in production right now. How is it performing right now? Can it monitor performance? And if it's not performing well, maybe new data has come in, trends have changed, and now the model that's in production is not performing so well. There's degradation. How easily can you go back and train it? Or how easily can you do another more model tournament? Right? That's governance. You're governing all your models. There's versioning. There's lineage. There's documentation. There's auditability. That's governance. Right? And in an environment like that, you're also reducing costs of deployment and validation because everything's managed, everything's governed, everything's one-click deployment. And on that note, you don't want to struggle when it comes to deployment. It's a sad day when you build a really great model and then IT tells you it cannot be deployed because it's simply too complicated to do the code translation. Right? That's uh, all that hard work for nothing. 
because this model will never actually generate insights. So you want to make sure that it's something that can actually be deployed. And then open APIs, and we heard about this a little bit earlier too. Uh, your modeling journey doesn't end when a model is built and it's published, right? Someone has to consume these results. These insights have to go somewhere. So how easily can you push these insights out to a web page or some other software or some other environment where someone can actually consume your predictions or your insights? Maybe through REST APIs. Are you working in an environment that allows you to do that? Right, so this whole thing is about ownership of the work that you're doing, right? Your AI solution should not block you. It shouldn't put brick walls in front of the work that you're doing, right? It should, it should open doors. And this is just a screenshot of what that repository might look like. But I'm going to go through this really quickly because I will actually show it in the environment as well. And the last thing is scalability. And we all know what this means, right? Can it scale? But again, to me, scalability means a couple of different things as well. In my experience, I've noticed that scalability isn't just about big data and building lots of models. It's also about, does it scale to a variety of users, right? Even here right now, under the big data science or artificial intelligence umbrella, each one of you have a combination of unique skill sets and preferences and ways of doing things, right? So in a data science team, you will always have people, data scientists, sure, but they will have their own programming language of choice, their own way of doing things, their own way of building things. Are you working in an artificial intelligence solution or an analytic solution that accommodates all these users? So on my team, for example, we have uh, open source programmers. There are people who code in R, or Python, or SAS. But they're all able to work in a common platform. They're all able to put their models in one repository or have their models compete against each other in a fair way. Right? So nobody's work is really wasted. And then there's me. I build my bot models in GUI. I like point and click pipelines. Don't judge me, I still build good models and they still compete with uh, my coworkers' models, but that's my preference and I'm able to do that. Right? So we need a solution that scales to all of our skill sets. That's one element of scalability to me. Scalability also means how quickly can you produce something? Does it take you days to build and fine tune a model? Or can you build lots of good enough models very, very quickly and have them compete with each other? Right? So that's where things like model templates help a lot. Because those are just like recipe books. Right? If I want to build a churn model, I will just go in and pick an out of the box template and tweak it as I need to. Or if I build a really cool model of my own, and I think that this is a good recipe and someone else might want to use it, I'll just um, create a user-created template and save it so there's no duplication of effort. Somebody else can pick it up and use it. So you're not redoing the work over and over. That's also scalability, because we can do mass modeling. We can build model factories. We can build lots and lots of models. And this becomes very important when you start doing segmented modeling, right? When you build little clusters and build models for each segment separately. Then you'd go into hundreds and hundreds of models. That's scalability as well. And on the topic of tuning, anybody here who has had to manually tweak a model knows the pain, right? You could go in and start selecting hyperparameters for your model, click run, see whether it's good or not, go back in, change the specifications, click run again, did it improve, did it not improve, who knows, right? So uh, something like auto-tuning can help a lot. Are we all familiar with auto-tuning? Heard about auto-tuning? No? So auto-tuning is a little piece of um, algorithm, and what it does is that it automatically tests different settings or different parameters, uh, different combinations of parameters for your model and com compares them to each other. Because ultimately you want a, a combination of parameters that gives you the best model output, right? And parameters are things like, if you're building a decision to your gradient boosting model, it'll be something like, well, how many, how deep do I want the tree There's to be? There's no one answer to that, because it will always depend on your data and the kind of problem you're trying to solve. So auto-tuning does that automatically. It says, I have picked the best optimal settings for you. Don't worry about it. Here's the best model you can possibly get on this data. That's what auto-tuning does. 
But something to keep in mind here is that not all auto-tuning algorithms are the same. A lot of auto-tuning models are random, which is similar to a person sitting and trying different combinations at random to see what works and what doesn't. And what happens with random is, as you can imagine, it takes a very, very long time. And I've seen situations where someone ran a random auto-tune um, on a model and got a, got a pretty decent result, ran it again, and started getting worse results. And we never found that optimal combination ever again. Well, we only tried for days, but. So it, it takes very, very long. So when you're looking at things like auto-tuning, ask, what is this algorithm? Is it a random search? Or is it something more sophisticated? Because there are more sophisticated techniques out there. Nobody has to settle for random searches. And the best that I have seen so far is something called a Latin hypercube. It works with a genetic solver to get you the best settings in seconds. Right? So how a Latin hypercube works is a random search will just go in and try many different things and see what's better, what's not. A Latin hypercube does it very smartly. So it will maybe start, let's say, over here see how the model performs, and then go very quickly to a very different part of the grid and see what performed better. And if this performed better, then it's going to stick to this area. It's going to narrow down its scope and start working over here. Right? So it does it a little bit more intelligently. And it gets you better results, and it gets you smarter results. So if you're a modeler and you're looking at auto-tuning, those are some of the questions you want to ask, because not all auto-tuning models or algorithms are the same. Scalability is also about the infrastructure or the architecture that's accommodating all your work, right? It's not just about how cool your algorithms are or how good your math is. It's also about can your servers even accommodate this? Can they run all this stuff that you've built, right? It's important to have intelligent processes, but if the underlying structure, the underlying server, is not intelligent enough, if it's not optimized to run these processes, then that's a bottleneck. Then your model's not running fast enough, and you're not getting results um, like you want to. Right? So that's another question that you might want to ask. There are things like parallelized algorithms that uh, distribute all your data on different machines. So now what happens is when your model runs, it can run many, many iterations very quickly, right? You know machine learning algorithms are very data hungry. They do their best when exposed to large amounts of data. So you need an architecture that accommodates that, right? Um, high performance, or um, you might also have heard of in-memory analytics, right? That's what it does. It allows for those multiple iterations, right? So your models run very, very quickly. And that's the good news. The bad news is that you can no longer hit run on your model and go for an hour-long coffee break, because the model's going to be running. Because this model's not going to run in seconds. Right? Um, fault tolerance, exactly what it sounds like. You have worker nodes that pick up each other's slack. So if one goes down, the others will pick up the slack, and your process is not interrupted. High availability, same thing. There is lower downtime. So like in my chatbot example, every time the user opens that app, that process that service is available for the user. There is no downtime just because one worker node isn't working. Right? And then deployment options. And I talked about this a little bit earlier, too, that you want to have ownership of the work that you're doing. You don't want to build great models that can never see light of the day, that will never be deployed. Right? No matter how you choose to deploy, you shouldn't be stuck. You shouldn't be limited by your architecture. Right? Suppose you're right now deploying in batch, and now you want to switch to real time. Are you going to have to change your entire code base or your entire architecture? You shouldn't have to. That switch should be very, very easy. So your architecture shouldn't be limiting. So what I want to do at this point is the chatbot example that I showed earlier was more from the customer side of how simple and easy it should be to consume the results of um, um, an artificial intelligence process. But I want to go into um, how it would look if you actually design something like this. You can hear me okay at the back, right? I don't really need the mic. Okay. So 
I'm in an environment right now, this is, this is where I build my models, this is where I deploy all my work, right? So no one was going to tell me, May, we can't see anything, you're just going to let me talk. <laughs> I'm actually waiting for someone to come help me. <laughs> Thanks, Harsh. Thank you. I will start again. This is the environment where I'll do all my modeling work. So the assumption here is that I've already prepared my data, I've already explored, visualized it, I've, I've built all my bottle, models in this blue box over here, but now I want to go ahead and manage these models. I want to show you what it, what it looks like when you have a model repository, a model library, what it looks like to govern this work. And then I'm going to go into manage decisions, because I want to take decisions based on what my model has built, right? So let's go into this yellow box over here, which is my model management environment, right? So as soon as I open it right now, I am able to see all the models that have been built. For people who can't see at the back, you can see the name of the model, there's decision trees, forests, um, where this model lives, who built this, when this was built and last modified. So there's, there's visibility into all the work that's been done, right? So let's just click into one to see what happens when you go into one. So when I go in, I'm able to see the score code and all the code files associated with this model. I can see what variables are used by this model, um, what role they're playing, all that. So this was, what I clicked into now was a SAS model. It was built in SAS. But in this repository, I also have open source models. Um, as you might have guessed, I didn't build them. My coworker did. So what we have here, this is a scikit-learn random forest, right? And the little badge next to it means that this is a champion model. This was the best performing model, and this is right now considered the champion. The one right above it is a random forest built in R, and it has a little flag next to it, which means this is a champion model. Now, this is a challenger model. So I'm just gonna go into the scikit-learn random forest, and just like I was able to see the score code for the SAS model, I'm able to see the score code for the scikit-learn model, which was not built in SAS. Because when my coworker built it and he registered it, all the code was automatically translated into SAS code. So now we're on a level playing ground. So this can now compete with my SAS models and work alongside all the other models, right? So it's just translated everything to a common code base. Um, on the side over there, I also have um, I can click and open the pickle files. I can open the independent XML if I'm interested in that. Again, I can go into the variables and see what variables this uh, model is using. And just for reference, we were building a uh, loan application model. So we were predicting probability of default when someone applies for a loan. Right? Um, I can see the variables. I can also go in and see versioning. Right? So these are the various versions that he had built, and this is the latest one. Right? So it's kind of like a, a model library where he has locked the other versions, but this one is up for grabs. If I want to use it, I can use it. I can check out this model. And if he wants to create a new version, he can go in, and this is just a way, it's just a label that helps you organize your models. If he wants to build something that he wants to put into production, he will call it major, otherwise he'll call it minor. It doesn't, it's just a way to organize things. So now I'm gonna go into projects. So a project will be a collection of models. So like I said, the, the stuff that we were working on, the problem that we were working on was loan application, right? So that's, that's my project over there. That's where all our loan application models are. So I would just select that and I would say publish. And that's what I mean by easy deployment. That there's a one click button that says publish this whole project put it in a deployment. And I've already done that. But like I said before, my goal here is to show you what happens after you're done modeling. What happens once you've put it in a deployment? What, how do you actually, because someone's gonna use the insights, right? Someone has to look at your model output and take action on it. So what does that process look like? So I'm gonna go into this purple box over here. That's purple, right? Yeah, this purple box over here and this is where I'm gonna start um, making decisions on my model output. So I have a project here called Loan Application. I'm gonna open that up. 
I've already created a decision flow that I want to show you. Okay, let's take a look at this. I've created a very simple one just for the sake of this demonstration, but you can, this can be as deep as you'd like it to be. So there are three types of nodes or boxes that I have here. This green one over here is just a threshold box. So it's saying, when someone's applying for a loan, is the loan value greater than 25K or no? If it is, then go down this branch. Otherwise, go down this path. And right now it's saying, if the loan value is greater than 25K, then use my random forest to make decisions. And I've used random forest for both branches, but of course, sometimes when you do segmented modeling, you might find that a gradient boost works better for a certain segment, a random forest works better for, a for another segment, and in that case, you would have a different model over here. But yeah, I just used uh, random forest to show you. So the second type of node or box is my modeling box. If I click into it, it will take me back to what I showed you earlier. So all that model information, all that score code that I showed you earlier, it's living in that box right here in my decision rule manager. So let's go back and show you the exciting box, which is the blue box, and that's my decision rule box. And this is where I, where I tell the application what I want done. And I've created a very simple set of rules, but this is how it goes. It says, if the probability of default, according to my model, is greater than 0.3, then do not approve this person for a loan. Otherwise, approve them for a loan. Right? Very simple, but in real life, of course, these things are a little bit more complicated. You can nest as many rules as you want. This can be deep. This can be complicated. But it is, uh, this is what it would look like. And like I said, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't just end here. This still has to go somewhere. And I don't expect um, a financial advisor or a call center agent to actually go into this rule manager and look through and decide whether or not to approve somebody for a loan or not, right? So I gotta push these results out somewhere and surface them in an easy to consume form or a page where that person can, who's not a modeler, who doesn't wanna read model output, can actually consume this. I'm gonna give you a second to admire this overly complicated web form that we built. We just built it from scratch and we're not, actual you know, web form developers, but suppose that um, this is what you fill out when you're applying for a loan, or this is what your financial advisor or the call center agent is looking at when you're applying for a loan, right? So it's asking you, uh, occupation category, how many years have you worked in your role, how much do you wanna borrow, what is the value for home, questions like that. And we'll just fill it out, right? These are just kind of inputs that will help you decide whether or not to approve somebody for a loan. Okay, and we hit check. And as soon as I will hit check, this will, these inputs will go back to my model, say, give me a prediction for this person. What is their probability of default? That prediction will then go through my rules and the answer will be surfaced here, right? Instantly, this is in real time. So it goes through and it says probability of default is 0.4, do not approve them. Right, um, and an app like this, um, sure, it could be in front of a call center agent, or a bank might also wanna put this on the website where customers can actually go in, or the general public can go in and see if they can get pre-approved, right? And in that case, of course, we will probably not show them their own probability of default. We will just say to them, sorry, you were not approved. Um, so this is, this is just to show how, how your insights and the work that you've done on the modeling side can go through and intelligently tell somebody or guide the process, right, and make it easier and faster as opposed to it taking much longer and taking days for someone to get approved or not. But another question that you might ask here is, well, criteria changes, right? Rules change. So what if we wanna go back and uh, make some changes? What if for some reason the bank's feeling riskier? And um, is this system rigid? Can we quickly change it, right? And would we need to pause this whole thing? Would we, put, would we take down this web page while we're going and making those changes to the rules? So we'll go back and we'll change it. So let's open this again. So right now it was at 0 0.3 and the person was rejected at 0 
So let's change it to something that would accept them. So instead of 0 0.3, we'll do 0 0.5. So what does it take to actually make that change and how quick is it? So all I do is hit save, so save my rules, go back to my process flow and hit publish. And when I hit publish, it gives me options. And again, this goes back to the deployment options. Where do you want to publish this? Do you want to publish this in, in, in MAS, which is just our real-time analytics service? Or do you want to publish this in Hadoop? Maybe you want to publish this in, in your own database. You should have the ability to do that. We're just going to publish it where it was before. And all it's asking me is, do you want to rename it? Do you want to create a new decision flow? No, I don't, just replace the existing one and hit publish. And it just takes a couple of seconds for it to publish it and tell you that it's done. And that's it, and now we can just go back and test it. Hit check again, and now that approval decision has changed. Right, so that's also very important. Sure, this is great and it works, but is it rigid? When things change, can we easily change it? Is it flexible? And that's what was important there, right? So this is just an example of how you would go from um, you've done your modeling, you've done your work, but what do you need to keep in mind and where does this work go and how easy is it, right? That's pretty much um, all I wanted to show today. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, disagreements? Yeah, yeah. So when you're, when you're experiencing things like that or if you're looking at solutions like that, um, the question there is not going to be about, well, how great are the algorithms, right? It's going to be about deployment and it's going to be about the architecture, right? And I'm not, um, I'm not very architecturally savvy, but I know the kind of questions to ask, right? And I would ask questions like, well, what is a fault tolerance like? Is this high availability, right? And it, it, more often than not, there will be yes or no questions, mm -hmm. right? Because I've seen, I've seen solutions that are, well, this is, a, this is a cloud solution and it does all this stuff and it, it's a full package and it's easy to deploy, but you're very limited to where you can deploy. They will only let you deploy in their database and if you want to go to the other major database, suddenly you need a lot of connectors and access engines and it's all extra, right? So um, I would say if you're looking at cloud solutions, you might want to ask questions around architecture itself. Right? But if you know that you're going to stick to one database and you want to use their infrastructure, then you're probably okay. Then it probably doesn't matter because everyone optimizes for their own database, right? Yeah, so it will just, uh, what it actually does is before you actually bring in a SAS, you will grab the PML file, right? So anything that was bad or any comments and notes, so comments and notes shouldn't really matter because they're not, they're not affecting your process, right? But anything that can be put together in a PML will easily be translated by SAS, right? And R&D has worked very, very hard for very, very long to be able to do this. And for that reason, we also don't translate absolutely everything, right? Because with open source programs, you have new packages coming out every other day. Someone sitting in their basement is creating a new library. And we don't want to be accommodating all that. We only take things that are tried and true and validated, right? And we translate that. So most major models and things that we see being used in the industry, we translate that. Like a trial, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we have uh, free trials. for So the interface that I just showed you where I had all those boxes where you go from modeling to managing decisions and all that, uh, there's a free trial online. You can even upload your own data, small data set. You can see what it feels like. Does it work? Does it not work? Um, there are also public workshops and webinars if someone wants to attend uh, for a specific industry. Um, I'm sure we have lots in Calgary, right? Harsh over there is your point of contact for everything happening in Calgary. Or if you want to come visit me in Toronto, I can hook you up with those as well. But, um, but yes, we do. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, if, you, if you're looking for a specific one, I would say reach out to Harsh or myself and we'll help you find it. But if you just look in, in general to see what kind of support we have, uh, you can check out the website. Uh, when I talked about model interpretability, and I can talk because I'm on the, on the modeling analytics side, so I can talk to that. Um, when I showed that screenshot for the PD plots and the ice plots, that's new. And that we've baked into 
our uh, modeling environment. So any model you build, you will have visibility and you will have explainability into that. And we've done that on purpose because we've, we've bragged about being a white box solution for 43 years, right? But then there comes a point in time where the algorithms that you're incorporating or machine, modern machine learning algorithms just by nature are black box, right? Like neural networks, like what do you do with that? So that's why we've done this on purpose where we've said, this is your modeling studio and there's a big button at the top that says model interpretability plots. You know, so that's, that's something that we've done on purpose. But uh, anything specific to GDPR? Yeah, and I think what I, a screenshot that I did have in there is um, data, data workflow or model workflow flow and lineage. So what that gives you is a, you have boxes and arrows showing, so going from your model all the way back to what data it's using, what tables it's using, and where they're coming from. So what Harsh described, we have an interface where you can go in and see what boxes, like a path diagram, showing exactly what data is being used and for what. And it also, apart from governance, also shows you, is there data that's loaded in there that's being used by no models at all? That's just a, it's a bad practice, so just get rid of that data set, unload that, that's just using resources. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you.